So thanks to the organizers for inviting Jessica and I to speak this afternoon. Uh, as we were introduced, we are veterinary radiation oncologists from the University of Georgia. We're very pleased and excited to be here. Although we don't get to work with dosimetrists on a day-to-day -day basis and in what we do, uh, the times in our careers where we have worked with dosimetrists, we've always learned a lot and had a ton of fun, so we're very pleased and, and honored to be here. We know that last year, uh, a colleague of ours, our, our world is pretty small, um, so our colleague, a colleague of ours was invited to speak about the dosimetric challenges of, uh, that we face in veterinary medicine. And this year, we were asked to speak about veterinary oncology in general to kind of give an overview um, of what we do. So what we decided to do is to divide, divide this talk in half. Um, I will start uh, with giving uh, the first 45 or 50 minutes. And what I'm going to do is give uh, basically zoom out and take a look into uh, veterinary oncology and give you a tour of what we do. I'll speak a little bit about um, our day-to-day -day procedures in radiation oncology. And Jessica will then follow and will speak about the forefront of veterinary radiation oncology, the state-of-the-art cutting-edge uh, equipment that is beginning to emerge in our field, um, talk about the dog as a model for cancer, uh, and talk about uh, where we're going really with our, um, with our profession. Uh, veterinary radiation oncology is actually one of the fastest growing specialties in veterinary medicine. Um, Jessica and I are uh, veterinary radiation oncologists. We're veterinarians. We both uh, finished our veterinary degrees in Canada. And like your, like your MD colleagues, followed our veterinary training with residencies, um, in, in our case, in medical oncology and uh, veterinary uh, radiation oncology. And the way that works is those are three-year programs, and they are followed up by certifying board exams. Um, and once those are completed, then we become board-certified specialists, um, in our case, in the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine for the medical oncology side, and the American College of Veterinary Radiology for the radiation oncology side. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, we're veterinary radiation oncologists. We're coming from the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Georgia. We work in Athens. We work there as uh, teachers, as researchers, and primarily as clinicians. And we work in the veterinary teaching hospital. Um, we treat mostly dogs and cats, as you'll see in the lecture. Um, occasionally, we'll treat a horse um, or uh, an exotic animal like a rabbit or a ferret. But by and large, our, our patient population um, are dogs and cats. And so, as I mentioned, radiation oncology um, and medical oncology, just generally veterinary oncology, is one of the fastest growing specialties. And that's probably in part due to the, the, the cancer statistics in dogs, and it's, these are, are figures from the ASPCA. Um, and it's quite staggering to, to think that 62% of American households actually have a pet, and the numbers are huge. There are 78 million pet dogs in the U.S. and 86 million pet cats in the U.S. And these are registered animals that we know about. Um, uh, of these animals, 6 million dogs would be diagnosed with cancer each year. And so it ends up affecting, the disease ends up affecting one out of three dogs, and half of which will actually die of the disease. And because of our breeding, um, our, our, our breeding behaviors um, for, for dogs in particular, there are some breeds that are predisposed to cancer, and if uh, any of you have questions about that, I'd be happy to, to address those at the, at the end of the talk. So you know, why treat animals with cancer? Um, obviously, there are lots of animals in the United States and North America in, in the developed world, um, and as veterinary medicine gets better, as it's improved over the last 10 to 20 years uh, with better food, better vaccinations and preventative medicine, um, Animals are just living longer, and they're living into their geriatric ages, and cancer has turned out to be a leading cause of natural death um, in, in, in our companion animals. And of course, there's the growing um, importance of companion animals in our lives and the human-animal bond. This is sort of the classic type of uh, situation or clientele that we face, people that, that just love their animals. Um, and uh, this here is a, also a classic Christmas card that we get where the animal sort of the star of, of the card. Um, and this just speaks to the importance of companion animals in our lives. And as, 
as this is, these two things have happened, as animals are living longer and they're developing cancer in their geriatric ages, um, and as they're becoming more important in our lives, we've also grown the field of veterinary oncology and our treatment options um, that I'll speak to you about in the lecture are, are, are getting better and more sophisticated. And so it becomes more reasonable, more realistic um, to, to treat animals without negatively impact, impacting their quality of life. This is um, also just another example of the kind of note that we get from, um, from, uh, from clients, from folks that we work with um, to treat their pets. Uh, this is from a gentleman whose, whose animal, whose dog George, passed away. Um, it says, thank you for all, for all you tried to save George. Um, please take good care of him. He was my best friend. Uh, these, these are kinds of things that, uh, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Animals just play a very important part in our lives. And so, of course, there's the, the companion bit um, where, uh, you know, they're, they're important in our lives for companionship, but it, there's also a very important role in society for working dogs in particular. Not so much cats, of course. I don't know a cat, a cat that likes to work, but dogs love to work, and they're very good at it. Um, and so we, of course, have dogs in, uh, in, uh, as police dogs. We have service animals. We have dogs in homeland security, uh, sniffing dogs at the airport. And these are all dogs that are highly trained, very good at what they do, and you know, it's not in our best interest and society's best interest to keep them healthy um, and, and working. And veterinary oncology plays a big role in that because, as I'll talk to you in a moment, uh, quality of life is a huge focus in what we do. And um, if we can keep dogs active and, uh, and feeling well, then they can continue to do the work that they do. So some of the myths that we face um, are uh, that it's just an animal. Um, you know, and well, often folks who don't who don't own pets, maybe or who don't recognize the role that some dogs play in our society, uh, will will take this perspective and say, "Oh, it's just an animal. Why treat them?" Um, but as I, for all the reasons I just mentioned, that's just no longer true for a good part of of of, uh, of us. And uh, and as you guys are quite familiar, also, you know, the idea that cancer patients are sick, or that cancer patients are in pain, or that we're just prolonging the inevitable. Um, these are also myths in veterinary oncology. Um, again, as I'll speak to you in a second, for us it's all about quality of life. Um, we walk a fine line between, uh, between treating a disease, maintaining um, uh, or extending, extending life, and also maintaining quality of life. And because animals don't deal with the emotional part of cancer, um, many of them, as you know, from your experience, you know, feel fine um, as they go through through this disease until a point where, yes, then the disease does, if it's not cured, um, eventually will come back and eventually will, will affect this, how an animal feels systemically. But up until that point, they're generally feeling quite well. Um, and so, so these are, are myths that we, 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 try to, uh, we try to break down or try to bust um, in, uh, in, our, in our client's eyes and in the public's eyes. Another very important part of what we do, uh, an emerging field in veterinary radiation oncology, is, is comparative oncology. And comparative oncology is really the opportunity to include naturally occurring cancer models in the study of cancer biology and therapy with the goal of, with the aim of, of, of improving uh, therapies for people. And, uh, you know, veterinary oncology is a relatively new field. Um, when Jessica and I trained in, uh, in, at the University of Wisconsin in medical oncology and radiation oncology, our mentors there were sort of grandfathers of our field. So, so we've not had many generations, if you will, of, of, of specialists. And what we've learned over this, you know, 10 to 20 years of veterinary oncology is that the, the dog is actually an excellent model for human disease. Not only are there, is there, are there tumors or their cancers not laboratory induced, I mean these are just, these are normal organisms on the planet Earth that develop spontaneous cancers, um, just like we do. And so that makes, uh, at least in theory, a much better model than the, uh, the, the induced tumors that, that we study in the lab in mice and rats or, or, or larger animals. So the fact that they're naturally occurring cancers is very, is very important. Um, and the reality, too, is as we study the, the molecular uh, components or the molecular mechanisms of cancer in dogs, we're learning that they're very similar to, to what we know in people. 
the diseases are very similar, as I'll talk to you about, and the therapies are very similar. So, so the dog, since the, the genome was sequenced um, about five or eight years ago, the canine genome was sequenced, it sort of exploded as a field of research learning about the biology of cancer and using it as a model for humans. And Jessica will speak much more to this um, uh, in the second part of our talk. So to go back sort of day-to-day -day veterinary oncology, um, we uh, work very similarly to, to how, how you all work. Um, basically, we diagnose and treat cancer in companion animals. We uh, work with pathologists to diagnose tumors. Um, you know, we'll sample tumors with fine needle aspirates or biopsies. Um, submit those to pathologists who are familiar with um, the morphologic appearance of different cancers to get a diagnosis. We work with board-certified radiologists um, to image the tumors, stage the disease, and then uh, we as veterinary oncologists come in with the treatment, with the chemotherapy, the radiation. We also use immunotherapies and biological targeted therapies, which I'll give you some examples of. This is by no means a, an exhaustive list of common canine cancers, um, but it's a, a, a list of, uh, you know, of probably the ones that we see the most in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, and I'll go through a, a little bit of the ones, or I'll go through a little bit of the, 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 the cancers that will be familiar to you from, from, the, human, um, from the human side. The, the first one, and by far the most common cancer that we see in dogs, um, and probably not, not so much so in cats, but definitely quite common in cats as well, it, and I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, but in dogs, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, is the, the bread and butter of our practices, if you will. These red dots here on this dog are the, the peripheral lymph nodes in a dog very similar to, uh, to humans. Um, and uh, when dogs are, are affected with lymphoma, it's all multi They present with the peripheral lymphadenopathy. And these, this is a highly responsive disease to chemotherapy as it, in, as it is in people. And the chemotherapy protocols that we use, again, are, are drugs that are probably familiar to you. We use cytoxin, doxorubicin, vincristine, and, and, and prednisone. And uh, while the, the chemotherapy schedules are different than what, uh, what is common in people, the drugs are the same, and it is a very responsive disease. Often these dogs will, or will be diagnosed because the pet owner will pet the dog and will find that, you know, will come and say, hey doc, hey doc, my dog has a lump in the neck or in the shoulder. This is a bull mastiff where the area of the lymphadenopathy has been shaved just for effect here. Um, and so you can see the sort of swelling in the neck and the swelling in front of the shoulder. And this is often how they, pr they will present with lymphadenopathy. And just like in people, some of these dogs will feel completely fine, will not know that they have this disease, and others will be, as we say, a substage B and will actually be ill, um, either lethargic, not eating, not feeling well, maybe even have some vomiting and diarrhea and fevers. Um, but it, many of them actually feel quite well at the time of diagnosis. And the good news with this disease, as in people, is that because it is so chemotherapy responsive, 90% um, of dogs go into a complete remission with an excellent quality of life. Um, and I'll speak again to the, to the balance in a moment of, that, we, that we try to attain in terms of efficacy with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, whatever kind of cancer therapy we're using, um, and quality of life. Because again, in veterinary medicine, this is all about quality of life. And another important um, important factor here is um, in humans, you know, because we live, you know, eight to ten times longer than dogs, uh, we measure in human medicine, we measure survival times or reasonable survival times in periods of five years. In dogs, we measure them in periods of a year, um, which, you know, in, relative to our perspective might not be a very long time, but a year could be a tenth or even more of a dog's life. Um, so uh, if we can achieve a, a, a remission um, on good quality of life, at least in the case of lymphoma, for a year, uh, then we'll, we'll consider that, that successful. The second disease I'll talk to you about is um, osteosarcoma bone cancer, which you're familiar with. This is also another great model for human disease um, uh, because most of the dogs that we treat are older animals, just like in people, but there is definitely a population of younger animals, mostly large breed dogs, that are affected by osteosarcoma, just like um, the demographic of, of children uh, in humans. So it, it's a disease that, that, that whose behavior and 
and um, demographic, I guess, is in parallel in, uh, to dog, in, in dogs and humans. And in dogs, it's mostly the long bones that are affected. This is a, a radiograph of humerus, and the proximal humerus here is mothing, as you can see, and this is a very common location for osteosarcoma in dogs. It's a painful disease, as you can imagine. Um, and the problem with this disease is that it has a very high metastatic rate, and most of the uh, most of the dogs succumb to pulmonary metastasis in the end. And with no therapy, that will happen within about four months of of, of, of diagnosis. What we do know is that if we if we amputate um, uh, the limb, the affected limb, and follow with platinum chemotherapy, so a, a cisplatin-based protocol or carboplatin-based protocol, that we can significantly extend survival. And the uh, median survival time is about a year to um, maybe a little bit longer uh, in dogs. So you know, 50% of dogs will survive to a year, which again, in our perspective, might not seem a lot, but in large breed dogs, those are the most commonly affected by this disease. It's a significant chunk of time um, of their lives. And there's also you know, a reasonable percentage, 20 percentage of dogs that will survive two years or longer um, and even be cured. This is a disease where it's not uncommon that as a veterinary radiation on, or veterinary oncologist, I see patients for recheck five or six years down the road uh, because they've been cured of their disease. So there's a reasonable percentage of dogs that actually can be cured with this therapy. It's also a disease, though, where um, you know it's not inexpensive, and I'll talk about cost in a little while. Um, but if for whatever reason the the client doesn't wish to pursue amputation and chemotherapy. Um, or let's say it's not ideal for the dog because the dog may have severe arthritis or neurologic disease where removing the limb would not be in the dog's best interest. Well, in that case, this is sort of a great model or a very common disease that we treat palliatively with radiation. Um, uh, and I'll speak about our protocols uh, in a little while, but we, uh, we, definitely pal we definitely do a lot of palliative radiation for osteosarcoma. And the goal there is is palliation, not necessarily extending survival time, but we're quite good at improving, um, improving, uh, improving pain, uh, reducing pain in these dogs um, pretty quickly with radiation therapy. Without the definitive therapy of amputation and chemo, dogs succumb generally in about four months from the metastasis, but with the, with the palliation we can improve their quality of life in between that time. And as I mentioned, it's a great model for human disease. And so, you know, uh, People who might not be familiar with, with tripods, as we call them, three-legged dogs, might think that the idea of an amputation is seemingly cruel to dogs. Um, but dogs, as, as a professor of mine used to say, really have an extra leg. They certainly don't <laughs> need four. These are just some pictures of, um, of dogs that I, that I took from, from the internet of uh, uh, dogs being active. This is a, a greyhound that was amputated, a forelimb was amputated. This back here is a tail, not a fourth limb. And they can swim, they can run, they can be completely normally active on three legs um, uh, as they can be on four. There's a website called tripods.com, which is where this picture came from in the next one as well. It's tripod, T-R-I-P-A-W-D-S.com. And it's a community of, of, of folks, of people who have dogs with three legs. And um, it's, a, I guess, a, a support group in a way. Um, and also a, a resource for folks who are considering amputating their dogs just to see how good the quality of life of these animals actually is. And we're very good at pain control as well as, as we are in people. So um, the actual procedure, you know, we can do an amputation, dog can go home uh, two days later. They, they stand almost immediately after the surgery and if we control pain well, then there's no reason they should even really be slowed down very much other than just the healing of the, of the amputation site. So this is another picture of a, a, a German Shepherd at the dog park, let's say, playing Frisbee. So they, they are normally very active. Um, the next disease that we'll talk about is melanoma, which you're very familiar with um, as a cutaneous disease. Um, in dogs, actually, uh, cats it's very rare, but in dogs, melanoma of the skin is quite common, but it's almost always a benign condition, um, very rarely malignant and an aggressive disease. Where uh, melanoma is very aggressive in the dog is when it occurs in the mouth. So as an oral tumor, melanoma is highly, highly aggressive. The problem with it is that even more so than osteosarcoma, it is highly metastatic. And this disease spreads to the lymph nodes and to the lungs, um, often within, you know, within six months of, of a diagnosis. 
And while we're quite good with radiation therapy at controlling the oral tumor, um, these are tumors that have a high alpha-beta ratio, um, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, have a low alpha-beta ratio, and they respond very, very well to course fractionated therapies. Um, and even with a so-called palliative course of therapy, which I'll describe in a minute, basically uh, one treatment a week for four weeks, so very few side effects, these tumors can shrink down to almost nothing, and we can palliate very well the mouth. The problem is, though, that, um, that they are highly metastatic. Size is very important for these dogs, for these tumors. So tumors that are smaller than two centimeters will, uh, will carry with them a much better prognosis than tumors that are larger than two centimeters. And that probably relates just to how long they've been present there. Larger tumors have been there longer, you know, more opportunity for, for metastasis. Um, so because we don't have a good chemotherapy uh, protocol for this uh, or an effective chemotherapy regime for this, um, dogs that present with large tumors, which often, often they do because, you know, we don't often examine our, our, our pet's mouths until there's a problem, um, which is often associated with a larger tumor, uh, we, um, uh, we ultimately we see, the, we see the tumors in the large, as, the, as they're larger. The one thing that I will talk about, which is actually quite fascinating and exciting in, in both human and veterinary uh, oncology, is the immunotherapy breakthrough, where now, although we don't have an effective chemotherapy um, regime for this disease, we do have, uh, we believe, an effective immunotherapy option, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, cats are different. <laughs> While dogs have a very similar very similar diseases, very similar, similar biologic behaviors, very similar treatments and outcomes to people. Uh, cats are very, very different. Cats hide disease very, very well. So we often don't find these diseases until they're quite large. The, by far, the most common cancer is uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma in cats. Um, again, we often don't know they're there until they're enormous. Um, this, while I mean, not it's big, um, certainly relative to the cat's size, it's quite large. Um, but there isn't a very good treatment option here, certainly not surgical, because you know, we'd, be, we'd be removing too much of this cat's maxilla to, to, uh, for the cat to, to, to have a good quality of life. So this is often the stage that we find these diseases in, and it's just not a good disease. The second most common is lymphoma in cats. And unlike in people and in dogs, where the disease is uh, multicentric. In cats, the most common location is the gastrointestinal tract. So here, you, these are the small, small intestine of a cat. Um, this is a mass effect, uh, a, a, a solitary mass of lymphoma that we certainly we can see, but what's the more common presentation is just a diffuse thickening of the intestines like you can see here, um, uh, affected by lymphoma. So GI lymphoma is very common. It's not as chemotherapy uh, responsive as the human or uh, canine version of this disease, but some cats will enter remission and have an improved quality of life. Not, not, the, not the high numbers that we see in people and in, in dogs, though. Now I'll speak a little bit about vaccine-associated sarcoma. This is, my, <laughs> this is my public service announcement to all you cat, cat owners out there. Um, vaccine-associated sarcoma is, unfortunately, a disease that we're inducing with our vaccines of cats. And some of you may have heard of this um, really, truly devastating disease. And it's a bit of an ethical dilemma, I think, for, for veterinarians, because these are, these are tumors that are incredibly invasive. They are the king of invasiveness. Um, and they, uh, they occur at sites of vaccination, specifically at sites of rabies vaccines or feline leukemia vaccines. Now, incidence isn't terribly high. It's one in 1,000 to one in 10,000 cats. So most people could go through their lives never even hearing about this disease. As veterinary oncologists, we see plenty of these um, because uh, you know, cats that do develop the disease might actually make it to the veterinary oncologist. And what's happening here is, well, first let me just say a bit about the vaccines. You know, vaccines are important. Um, the, not only do they protect the cats, um, from disease, especially if they're outdoor animals. Uh, but they're also important for, for public health, in particular with vaccine, you know, we, or with rabies vaccines. Uh, rabies is a, is, a, is a zoonosis, and it does uh, affect humans. And so there, there is legis legislature that requires 
uh, cats and dogs, pets, to be vaccinated for rabies. We really have no option but to, to vaccinate these animals. And what we're finding is that in cats, this is the only species that I know where this happens, um, in some animals, the inflammation that's induced by the vaccine will become malignantly transformed and will turn into a tumor. And the timeline between that is could be anywhere from six months to 10 years. So sometimes it's, it's a mass that grows on a cat, you know, 10 years after a vaccine. So not only is it difficult to follow um, or to know which vaccine actually caused the tumor, uh, but uh, it's not something that we necessarily expect so far on down the road. But we believe that this, this originates from sort of an inflammation gone bad, if you will. And Ultimately, what these cats succumb to is just progressive local disease. These tumors can become huge and become ulcerated, um, cause uh, cachexia, lethargy. Um, they can uh, also metastasize, but the most common form of progression of this disease is local growth. And this is a disease that, you know, this is a little sch a schematic here that shows this red dot here is the tumor, the bit that we can see and feel. And these little red dots represent the just extensive microscopic disease that we see associated with this tumor. So in a cat, like, for example, going back here, that has a tumor that's really only a couple centimeters on the shoulder, um, because of the just invasiveness, the incredible invasiveness of these cells, we can expect microscopic disease to extend, in some cases, five centimeters beyond the actual primary tumor. So the problem with this disease is really the local extent of the, of the, of the, of the cancer cells. And the treatment of choice in this case is radiation and surgical resection. But here's the problem. Um, even with a large resection, if this gray area represents um, the surgery, site, um, we often don't get the whole disease because we don't get all of the cancer cells. Uh, we're not, we don't successfully remove them because it is that invasive tumor. And so as a result, what we end up with is a cat that has a surgical scar, and in this case you might be able to make out the scar here along the cat, um, and recurrence, multiple recurrences along, along the scar, or even little you know, recurrent satellite recurrences around the scar. And so this is a classic presentation for this disease. So, and this is what we're faced with um, as radiation oncologists, you know, after a huge large excision, um, even a big one like this, this is a sort of double Y uh, incision here that extends really from the sternum of the cat up to the dorsum of the cat with all the critical structures underneath, spine, uh, there's liver under here, probably some lung, maybe even cobble heart in this radiation field. So, um, so our challenge is, as radiation oncologist is how, how do we treat these huge scars and it's not uncommon that a mass like this will be removed even maybe by an aggressive surgeon where a lot of tissue is taken but just because of the invasiveness of this even a cat with a scar big will come back with an incomplete resection cancer cells at the margins of the excision and so then radiation therapy is the, the next option to treat this and so Really, the first way to manage this disease is to prevent it. Um, and over the last decade, since, since now probably even 15, 20 years, since this disease has been described, we have, as a veterinary community, mandated, I guess, if you will, where vaccines should be delivered in cats. And so there's two reasons for this. One is so that if we follow this map, um, and if, if leukemia, uh, feline leukemia is vaccinated cats are vaccinated in the distal left limb, and if rabies is, is delivered into the distal right limb, then not only can we follow years down the road which vaccine actually caused this, caused this tumor, which helps us understand more about the pathology of the disease, the pathogenesis of the disease, um, but it also if the tumor develops distally on a limb, um, as much as we hate to consider amputating a cat, at least it's a treatment option um, where, you know, we don't need radiation therapy, perhaps, if the tumor is distal enough, and if we catch it early enough, then amputation could be curative for these cats. So this is, again, my public service announcement. For those of you who have cats who go to the vet and get vaccinated, veterinarians should be vaccinating um, these cats according to this map and as distally as possible or as low as possible on the limbs so that if the tumors do develop, there is a surgical option. Um, and, uh, and where we do want to avoid is in the interscapular region because surgery is just very difficult over the spine. 
um, uh, and in the, on the dorsum of the cat. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of cats get vaccinated just because it's easiest to access the top of a cat. Um, but keep this in mind next time you take your cats to the vet. So, you know, we still see these tumors. Um, we still see them in areas where amputation isn't an option or where a definitive surgery isn't an option. So what we developed, what we found, the best way to treat these is with preoperative radiotherapy. So rather than use a, you know, five to ten centimeter scar as your target um, for, uh, for, uh, for radiotherapy or as your GTV, if you will, around which you build a CTV and a PTV, um, if we do this before surgery, then our target is really just the mass itself. And if we measure even as many as five centimeters around the primary tumor, as our GTV, and if we, we create a PTV that's you know, even five centimeters around that, that's a more treatable area than using a 10 centimeter uh, target that would be the scar. So with preoperative radiotherapy, um, uh, our field is smaller, and our target is also not you know, the billions of cells that might exist along an incision, but it's, they're rather, I don't want to say our target, but the, the, that's the wrong term, but the cells that we're really aiming to sterilize here are the cells on the periphery that with surgery we might not actually remove because all of this surgically will be removed after the radiation therapy. So, so we do the preoperative radiotherapy. We take these to about 48 or 50 gray over about a month, four weeks of therapy. Um, then an aggressive surgery um, is done to remove the primary tumor and you know, the, whatever microscopic disease can be removed safely without harming the cat, the more aggressive the better. And then we have a scar, and hopefully whatever microscopic disease is left along the scar will be sterilized from the radiation. So by doing the radiotherapy preoperatively here, um, we're just able to, I think, be more effective, mostly because of the limitations of the normal critical structures, um, uh, rather than having to do with the sensitivity of the cancer itself. And because we still see these huge scars, I mean, we still have these huge targets, um, we find that the electron beam is, uh, electron beam therapy is probably, in many cases, a, an effective and the best way to, to uh, treat many of these cats. The problem is, of course, the curvatures. Um, so we, we like to work with surgeons quite a bit to orient uh, or to specify how we'd like the scar oriented to optimize, um, to optimize our radiotherapy approach. So we do work very closely with surgeons, as I said. This is a dog that also had a uh, sarcoma um, that was, you know, the, we were quite confident or the surgeon was quite confident that he would be able to remove the whole thing uh, with an aggressive surgery. So the scar in this dog also extends from the dorsum down to the sternum. Unfortunately, it wasn't a complete surgery or it wasn't a complete excision. And so the dog was sent to me as a radiation oncologist to, to clean this up. And of course, with photons, um, uh, this is a hard area to treat because of all the critical structures underneath. Um, so this is us trying to, you know, trying to make the field flat for electrons. Um, uh, but the point is here that we do work closely with, with surgeons and we're most effective when we work very closely with them and where we collaborate before actually radiation therapy, before the surgery to, uh, to, uh, come, to a, come to an agreement about how the scar should be oriented. So in you know, centers of excellence, we actually do this um, where we, we collaborate with each other on, on each cancer patient before surgery. And we also ask them to place hemoclips um, at the time of surgery in subcutaneous tissues so that we know how far they, they, uh, how far they went into the subcutaneous tissues or into the deep tissues under the skin so we can appropriately draw our targets um, rather than just use the, the scar itself as the, the origin of the, of the field. Um, after surgery, we, also, we do a lot of chemotherapy, as I mentioned. Um, we use many of the same drugs as we use for human patients. We use IV medications, oral medications, subcutaneous drugs. Um, and as I mentioned, the quality of life is our focus. Um, as I'll mention in a few minutes, we see many of the same toxicities that are seen in people, um, but we don't, uh, we don't deliver as high, I would say, relative doses as is delivered in people, and we don't deliver them as intensively as is done in people. And the reason for that is, again, that our goal is quality of life. So we walk this very tight rope of, of, uh, um, of 
balance, if you will, between efficacy and toxicity. And over the you know, past several years, our supportive medications, in particular our uh, GI toxicity prevent preventative drugs, um, uh, anti-nausea medications, anti-diarrheals, have become quite sophisticated in veterinary medicine, and that allows us to give drugs like cisplatin um, that in, induce vomiting um, as soon as they're administered, having nothing to do with the GI tract, but stimulating the chemo, chemotherapy trigger zone in the brain to induce vomiting. And that's a horrible thing to do to a dog. Um, but with the excellent um, uh, anti-nausea medication that we have, we're able to, to prevent that. And so with the better drugs, with the better supportive drugs, we're able to do more with the chemotherapy. And so, for example, my father was diagnosed with uh, lymphoma of the liver, and I was shocked to hear that he got, uh, he received doxorubicin, vincristine, and cytoxin as a package on the same day. That's not what we do. We don't deliver drugs that intensively. Our, our CHOP protocol for lymphoma is delivered weekly. So one week, week one, we deliver vincristine, week two, cytoxin, week three, vincristine again, and week four, doxorubicin. And it cycles through that, that, that protocol for about 19 to 25 weeks. So the, the, the approach is a little bit different in veterinary medicine um, in order to maintain this quality of life. Um, of course, uh, you know, we also emphasize safety of the patient and the personnel. Um, this is a uh, sort of uh, where I worked before I came to the University of Georgia. This was a hood where, in, in this case, the veterinary technicians drew up the chemotherapy drugs. Um, here at the University of Georgia, we have a pharmacist that, that draws them up. Um, this is how we deliver the chemotherapy. And now in the last year, so a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, clinics are using the Fossil system, which is a closed chemotherapy delivery system, really to manage personnel's exposure to um, to, to invisible chemotherapy fumes that inevitably will be will be uh, will be present when you don't use a closed system. So this this fossil system is is uh, very prevalent in human medicine, human chemotherapy delivery, and, and we're also using it a lot in, in veterinary medicine as well. And just like in um, in people, we place IV catheters. Uh, we make sure that catheters are well placed, and and we then deliver drug. Uh, the with dogs and cats, for that matter, a chemotherapy delivery really requires two people: um, one to one person to restrain the animal, the other person to deliver the drugs. And you might think that we have to, you know, fight with these animals to restrain them to deliver the chemotherapy, but it's actually not that way at all. Um, we generally uh, have to go back here. We generally have uh, chemotherapy wards that are, you know, quiet, where uh, it's just the the personnel delivering the drug and the animal pretty tranquil environment. Um, most animals, you know, once they're they're restrained just like this, they they will lie still. We very we almost never have to sedate an animal or anesthetize them for chemotherapy delivery. Um, just like in people, we do um, you know the risks associated with chemotherapy delivery um, are significant. Uh, these are examples of uh, vincristine slough and doxorubicin slough. So um, of course uh, Doxorubicin is a, a vesicant in dogs as well. Uh, vincristine is an irritant. Um, vincristine sloughs uh, are not that severe. Um, they're kind of like hot spots if you're familiar with those in dogs. Um, they will cause a little bit of uh, ulceration here, and the dog might, you know, find it itchy and wants to lick it. But generally, it heals, you know, within a few days to a week. Um, uh, doxorubicin, a doxorubicin slough, on the other hand, is catastrophic. I've knock on wood, never seen one. Um, in my career, this is a this is a series of pictures that I took from a journal article about a doxorubicin slough, um, and we do everything that we can to prevent these. Obviously, um, like I said, I've never seen a doxorubicin slough, and Christine, I've seen from time to time. But our goal is never to have this happen with with good chemo, good catheter placement. The problem with doxorubicin is that it is just so necrotic. Um, and if the full dose is delivered without knowing that it is subcutaneous and not going intravenously, then the drug will just travel up the limb. And where where an amputation might seem like a reasonable, you know, option, um, if if it were a focal um, if it were a, a focal necrosis, the problem is that if we don't catch it early, the necrosis extends up here into the sternum and then amputation. As you can see, this side <coughs> is thicker than this side. There's just no way that an amputation would would 
fix this dog's problem. So this dog, I have no doubt, succumbed to this, um, to this, uh, to this accident, if you will. Um, so, but again, so we deal with many of the same chemotherapy uh, safety issues um, as in people, and I'm you know, pleased to say we're quite good at doing, <laughs> at delivering chemotherapy, and these problems are quite rare. Um, that aside, the, the normal chemotherapy toxicities that we see are very similar to people. We, uh, we see myelosuppression, we see GI toxicity, and we see hair loss. Um, again, all of this is within the idea that we're trying to maintain quality of life. Um, as far as the GI toxicity goes, I mentioned that we have great gastrointestinal supportive drugs, myelosuppression, we monitor that with regular CBCs, and the hair loss is actually a little bit different in dogs than it is in people. Um, you know, in people it's quite common that we lose our hair because we have a continuously growing hair coat. Most dogs, the large, large majority of our patients, will not lose their hair, and that's because they don't have continuously growing hair coats. The breeds of dogs that do have continuously growing hair coats, like for example this um, Bouvier or like a Cocker Spaniel or a Schnauzer, those dogs that require going to the groomers, you know, to get haircuts, um, those are the dogs that, like us, will lose their hair. But your regular Golden Retriever or Labrador, um, the, those patients, unfortunately, we see a lot just because there's so many of them. They're such wonderful animals. Everybody wants one, <laughs> so they do get a lot of cancer. Um, uh, but they don't lose their hair. So those aren't dogs that are identifiable at the dog park as, as being on chemotherapy. It's only the dogs with continuously growing hair coats that have to go to the groomers where we actually see hair loss. Again, quality of life. Uh, chemotherapy is uh, uh, the goal of this is quality of life. This is a, a dog, Birdie, that um, uh, was struck by two cancers. One, she had a sarcoma on her neck here that was treated with radiotherapy. Then she was diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, she went through chemotherapy, and this is actually two years later. Um, she was lucky enough, knock on wood, to be cured of both diseases and continued duck hunting while um, she was going through her chemotherapy. And that's it's obviously very important to owners who decide to go through this emotional journey of treating their pets for cancer. It's very important that quality of life um, is maintained. Um, you know, I just mentioned this dog that had these two expensive therapies. She uh, had uh, um, insurance, pet insurance, which hasn't hasn't really taken very hold very hold, hold very well um, in North America, but in uh, the UK and other parts of Europe, um, pet insurance is very very common and allows for these animals to to uh, to get to get therapy to be fully treated for their cancers without causing a huge strain financially for the owners if they decide to do this. Um, so hopefully, uh, over time, pet insurance will become more common here because these therapies, as I'll mention, are not inexpensive. Now, I'll say a few words about biological therapies. Um, in human medicine, uh, this is an, an area that has exploded, as you know, um, with uh, the various uh, antibody therapies and uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, that have been developed um, for, human, for human disease. Um, we are also um, on that path. We're looking into and discovering the molecular mechanisms of cancer in dogs. And this is the first drug, it's called Palladia. Um, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that, um, uh, that inhibits a, a growth factor, three growth factor receptors on the surface of cells, a CKIT receptor, platelet-derived growth factor, and vascular endothelial growth factor receptors. And for cancers where these receptors play a role in the pathogenesis, yet the theory is that this drug May um, uh, may uh, improve outcomes and and play a supportive role, if you will, in combination with uh, chemotherapy drugs, uh, chemotherapy treatments, and radiation therapy treatments. This is interestingly the first drug that has ever been approved for use in veterinary chemotherapy or cancer therapy drug that has ever been approved for use in veterinary medicine. While we've been using chemotherapy, the more standard chemotherapy drugs for for decades now, we use them off-label. They're not actually approved for use in veterinary species. Palladia has been approved um, by the FDA. It's the first drug approved for canine neoplasia, for canine cancer. Um, and it is approved for use in mast cell disease, but we are um, exploring other potential indications um, in other diseases. So this is a sort of hotbed of research in, in, uh, in veterinary oncology right now. And I mentioned earlier the immunotherapy breakthrough um, that we made with canine melanoma. And again, canine melanoma is a problem of the oral cavity. 
tumors of the mouth are highly malignant and aggressive. And this is a fascinating story of a collaboration between veterinary oncologists and human um, oncologists and human cancer researchers. <clears throat> This, this vaccine, and it's a therapeutic tumor vaccine, not a preventative vaccine, it's a therapeutic tumor vaccine that um, came out of a collaboration between, uh, between scientists at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, and the Animal Medical Center, which is a huge private veterinary hospital in, um, in New York City, in Manhattan. And what was uh, the problem here, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that oral melanoma is a highly metastatic tumor, and we don't really have a good adjuvant therapy um, or chemotherapy for this disease. So we, uh, and in people, this is a, um, a disease where immunotherapy has shown, potential, at least potentially, has been shown to have promise. And so this collaboration of these two groups led to the development of a xenogeneic DNA uh, vaccine. And so what this is, this is a plasmid, or really just a piece of DNA, um, that in it, it is encoded a gene for tyrosinase, for the human gene of tyrosinase. And tyrosinase is an enzyme that is involved in the production of melanin. So, uh, so in melanocytes that develop into melanoma, there is tyrosinase to, to produce melanin. And so what's happening with this vaccine is that the, uh, the, the, the genetic code here in this vaccine um, results in the production of tyrosinase of the human protein, though, in the dog. And so what happens here is that if you were to use the dog version of the canine version of this protein and give it to a dog, the, the dog's immune system would not recognize it as foreign and would not mount an, an immune response to it. Um, it would just sort of say, okay, so here's more of the, the tyrosinase protein that I already have in the body, so it would not mount an immune response to it. But if you inject this plasmid that produces human tyrosinase protein, the dog's body, the dog's immune system recognizes that as foreign and mounts an immune response against that tyrosinase. And that, in, in, in successfully treated patients, that immune response against the tyrosinase will cross-react with the dog's, uh, the dog's tyrosinase, and the, there will be an immune response against the dog's tyrosinase, which, in, which would target the cancer cells. So this is actually um, a, the first um, approved therapeutic vaccine for any species for cancer. And it, again, uh, was developed for dogs through this collaboration between these two groups. And based on the success of this model of this vaccine, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering scientists are working on, uh, on uh, vaccines for people with this model, for human cancer with, these mo with this model. And the couple notable things, one is that because the, the, the dog life cycle and the dog cancer cycle is much faster than it is in humans, this vaccine really came, in, in, came to be much quicker than a human vaccine would be um, uh, because A, we don't have as much uh, regulation and red tape to go through in terms of clinical trials, but also the, the course of the disease happens faster. So we get, we get results much faster in dogs than we do um, in people, which again speaks to why they're good models. And the beauty of this, of this collaboration was that we found a therapy that works well for dogs um, uh, and also has informed the human experience, which is exactly why we use dogs as a model. So, um, so this is a vaccine that is delivered with this kind of, um, this kind of uh, injector. It's injected into the thigh where there's a lot of meat, if you will, a lot of muscle. And it is injected as, as a shower as opposed to just like a blood, like a, 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 a droplet of vaccine. And it, because it's a shower of droplets, um, there's more contact with the, the dog immune system um, with the plasmid. Um, and the way it works is that they're giving Four doses are given at two-week intervals and then boosted every six months. And what we found is that dogs, um, where historically they were dying of, uh, of metastatic disease, regardless of how effective radiotherapy was in the mouth, they were dying of metastatic disease at about six to eight months. We're finding now that um, if we can control the oral tumor, and the vaccine has less to do, if you will, just the, the microscopic metastatic disease to deal with, then uh, these dogs can have 
extended life expectancies, we believe, it's too soon to say, but we believe over, over a few, few years at least. So this is so far a very, very um, promising therapy for us. Now I'll, I'll, I'll speak about you know, what we're all familiar with the most, and that's radiotherapy. Um, this is a, a picture of the linear accelerator that we have um, at the University of Georgia. It's an older unit. Um, it's refurbished from, um, uh, from a human hospital where it was used before that hospital upgraded their equipment. And, uh, and it's a 6x Siemens unit. Um, I'll give you more details about it momentarily. Um, our vault, as you can see, is quite small. Uh, the vault used to house a cobalt unit that was decommissioned in order to move on to a linear accelerator. That happened a few years ago. Um, and now we have, we have this unit. We also have um, uh, I131 treatment for cathode hypothyroid disease, and we also have the strontium probe for superficial tumors. The, the types of cases that we treat with strontium most commonly are um, um, equine, excuse me, equine ocular tumors. Um, horses that stay out in the sun a lot get a lot of suede and cell carcinoma on the conjunctiva, conjunctiva or cornea of the eye. Um, and they're not very, if they're caught early, they're not very invasive tumors. And strontium is actually a wonderful, uh, the, beta, the beta particle therapy from the strontium is a wonderful way to, to treat those in, in, one, in, one, in one treatment. This is, this is actually a, a horse that is anesthetized. Um, with the, the tumor was resected, and now we're following with radio, we're following with, with strontium. So our facility at the University of Georgia, at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital, we are, Jessica and I, are two double-boarded, we call ourselves double-boarded because we do both medical um, and radiation oncology. So there are two of us double-boarded oncologists. We also have two medical oncologists. So we, we all work together with some residents and house officers. Um, we uh, predominantly, as I mentioned earlier, treat mostly cats and dogs. The occasional horse or exotic animal we treat as well. Uh, we have an integrated service where the radiation oncologists, Jessica and I, uh, work very closely with the medical oncologists. Um, so we, we work as, as, as a close team as opposed to being two separate departments or two separate services. We find that that's very doable in veterinary medicine, and I think it leads to better patient care. Um, and our throughput, though, in the veterinary facility is much lower than what you're used to, um, where I think it's not uncommon to treat between 30 and 60 patients in a human facility. Um, we, because A, we're a smaller team, and B, because we have to anesthetize our patients. You know, if we treat 10 to 15 patients in a day, that's a really good day. Um, more often, it's, you know, fewer than 10 patients per day. Um, we have a, a Siemens Mevatron Linac. It's, uh, it has 6 MV and 10 MV um, photons, but 10 MV are disabled just because we're not shielded for them. Um, we have various electron energies. We have an MLC, a 58-leaf MLC. We are using uh, a version 10 of Varian's Eclipse and Aria. We have basic IMRT step-and-shoot capabilities, um, and we have uh, advanced imaging CT and MRI um, for, for treatment planning. So this is sort of the the, uh, the picture of our, of our facility. And in veterinary medicine, if this is a, a, a schematic of the, the evolution of radiation oncology, if you will, and the, the progression of advancements in technology, um, where 3D conformal therapy really boomed in the 1990s, I realize it's still used uh, quite a bit in human medicine, but I think in human medicine, we've moved more towards IMRT and IGRT. In veterinary medicine, by far, I would say most facilities are still using 3D conformal RT. We're moving more and more to intensely modulated radiation therapy. Um, and there are a couple facil facilities, as you'll see, of IGRT where we can do stereotactic radio surgery. Um, and that's also becoming more and more prevalent in the last several years in, in, in veterinary radiation oncology. This is a map. Um, it's dated from last year of the United States with the radiation therapy centers where we have linear accelerators um, that are used for animals in the United States. States, you can see it follows population, which makes sense. Uh, but there are, you know, several, um, several facilities, uh, several facilities, both academic institutions and private practices, specialty hospitals. This now is a map of IMRT facilities, so significantly fewer, um, where uh, IMRT options exist. 
and even fewer are uh, IGRT options. Now there are several in the United States and, and people who can will travel um, if, they, if they want to. There, these dots here aren't misplaced. These are Canadian sites um, of IGRT and they're also actually uh, booming in Europe as well in Zurich in Italy, in Germany, um, in France. There are uh, certainly 3DRT sites, um, IMRT and for those institutions that are getting new units now, they're moving towards IGRT capable system. So, so this is again a booming field and, um, and it's growing. Um, these are pictures courtesy of the Colorado State University Animal Cancer Center there, which is one of the sites of um, the IGRT equipment. This is Varian's trilogy uh, that they have there. Um, uh, and so, you know, onboard imaging is also um, growing in veterinary medicine. The way that we're probably, um, you know, for you most significantly different than um, or the way that we're mo most significantly different is our is our therapy team, um, where this is I think very very crudely the the the, the, the team in human medicine where you have the radiation oncologist, dosimetrist, medical physicist, and radiation therapist. This is how it, it works in 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 dogs and in cats. So the dosimetrist and the radiation oncologist are kind of fused into Jessica and me, into the veterinary radiation oncologist. So we do not only the prescribing and the conjuring, but we also do the planning. Um, that's why I mentioned earlier, you know, when we work, when we do get to work with you guys, we learn a ton, um, and uh, it's always it's always a, an enlightening experience to work with you guys um, because our because we've evolved from you know mostly manual planning to 2D planning, 3D planning, and IMRT. Um, we're realizing as we become more sophisticated that dosimetry really is. Um, you know, it's a time-consuming thing as you get as we get better at it, and it really is, um, and it really is obviously, as you know, a, a career in and of itself. So as we as we move towards more sophisticated therapies, it becomes very difficult for us time-wise to do both: to be both the, the doctor that sees the pets, deals with the clients, and also just the planning. Um, so it's very possible that we will be, you know, reaching out to do, dosimetrists. Um, our problems we have <laughs> we just can't afford you um, uh, I mean that's the sad reality we would love to work with you more often but um, we're just limited in terms of in terms of what we can afford because we have to keep costs down for for the public um, we have a medical physicist consultant not one on site uh, but we have a physicist who comes does our QA verifies our plans um, you know talks to us about questions that, or answers our questions that kind of thing um, and Radiation therapist is also, our therapy um, situation is a little bit different as well. While some sites will actually work with um, actual radiation therapists, trained radiation therapists, the more common model is using veterinary technicians who are trained in radiation therapy delivery. So these are individuals who actually get very good at um, not only anesthesia, um, of the pets, but also um, running the linear accelerators, setting patients up, that kind of thing. But their their training, their experience, their background is nowhere near um, what it is for radiation therapists. Um, so this is you know our small team. Jessica isn't in this picture, but this is our small team at the University of Georgia. Um, every patient has a, a, you know one of us as radiation oncologist and and I guess dosimetrist or treatment planner and also two technicians, one who for each treatment will be monitoring anesthesia and the other who will be doing patient setup and running the linear accelerator. So there are at least two people with each patient um, as, they're, as they're treated. Because these are animals and we need them to lie still for the treatment, um, we do need to anesthetize them. Um, uh, and it's just simply for immobilization. As you know, we're not doing anything painful, so, uh, so our anesthesia is very gentle, if you will. Um, we use a rapid induction agent like propofol, a gas inhalant, um, and then the recovery is very quick. Um, because most of our patients have just focal solitary tumors and they're feeling well otherwise, there's usually minimal anesthetic risk um, associated with this. They are anesthetized in the vault when the beam is on. They're there obviously by themselves in the vault. So we have a visual monitoring equipment from the console. Uh, or from the vault in the console so we can monitor the patients while they're in there being treated. Um, and it's, it's amazingly, it's tolerated very, very well for, da for daily treatments. That's 
most clients' number one concern is, you know, how can you anesthetize my patient every day for this? And usually by day two or by day three, they realize that, um, that it's really a, a minimal concern and the animals go home and have a completely normal day after the treatment. The anesthesia is so gentle, if you will. But it does slow our throughput, and because we have a small team, um, we can really only treat a handful of patients every day. Um, that's not to say there aren't compromised patients that have cardiac or renal disease. They're perhaps more vulnerable to complications, and in those cases, we will actually work with the anesthesiologists um, uh, who they will oversee the anesthesia, will take care of the radiation bit. Um, and while that collaboration, I'm sure, in human medicine happens all the time, um, it certainly could happen for us all the time. The problem is if we, we involve the anesthesia service, um, it slows us down even further um, and, uh, and, 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 and truly are, we're quite good at anesthesia ourselves and um, for the, the, the minimal risk that's associated with most of our patients, um, we, do, we do quite well. So the other major difference um, is the fractionation schemes in veterinary medicine. We have both definitive and curative intent approaches and also palliation. Um, for the definitive treatments, we'll treat Monday to Friday. Um, our fraction sizes usually are not smaller. Our fraction is usually not smaller than 2.5 gray. Um, the highest that we have is 4.2 gray. There's a particular protocol for a nasal tumor, sort of like the head and neck, um, head and neck tumors that you all see, where we'll treat with 4.2 gray for 10 fractions. Um, uh, but generally our fraction sizes are somewhere between 2.5 and 3 gray. And uh, treatment times are generally two to four weeks. Um, four weeks is, you know, for, for a dog or cat and their pet owner, four weeks is a long time. Um, so we, we really can't do practically, realistically speaking, can't really do more than four weeks. I mean, biologically there's no reason we couldn't. Even the anesthesia would be tolerated, I, I believe, more than four weeks. But practically speaking, for the life of the dog and the pet owner, um, four weeks is, is uh, beyond four weeks is probably impractical. Our palliative protocols, like in your world, vary um, significantly. We often treat um, a very common protocol is eight gray per fraction for four weekly fractions. This is a classic melanoma protocol, as I mentioned. While it's not really palliative, um, with the low alpha beta ratio of that disease, it's, it's quite responsive to course fractionated therapies. Um, we, can all, we also do six gray six times. Um, we have lots or single fractions of, you know, 10 gray for osteosarcoma if there's already metastasis, that kind of thing. Um, so our palliative protocols vary. The cost of radiotherapy. Um, in general, again, we, we, ha we have to justify the cost of the equipment and the personnel, but we also aim to maintain, uh, maintain cost doable for, 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 for the public. Um, the cost is about, it's not inexpensive, um, uh, but the cost is $250 per fraction. That includes anesthesia. There's a $100 to $200 planning fee, um, which is not very much, of course, but, you know, it, it, it's what folks can afford, I think. Um, uh, the definitive course of therapy will cost, depending on how long we're treating, somewhere between $700 and $5,200. Boarding costs, if the animal stays with us over this time, is in addition to this. So, um, for example, a vaccine-associated sarcoma treated over a month can cause can cost about six thousand um, dollars, and that's not including surgery and all the other things that are involved. This is just the radiotherapy. A palliative course will be twelve hundred to seventeen hundred, depending on how many fractions we're doing, and those are the, the protocols that we um, that we generally use. Um, as we become more sophisticated with our therapy, with our IMRT and IGRT, even our 3D conformal RT, you know, um, the, the reliability of positioning, as you know, is very important. Um, and uh, most, of the, most of the vendors don't sell mobilization devices for, for dogs and cats, so we have to sort of, we have to home make our own uh, mobilization devices. This is um, a plexiglass box that we've uh, created. Um, with uh, 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 this was actually a design that was uh, created at the University of Zurich. They were kind enough to share it with us, and we modeled it after their system. Um, and uh, the, obviously, a mobilization mattress to support the body, and then a bite block on this bridge here that extends over this over this over this box. Um, and bite block is simple dental mold that fixes the head, prevents the pitch and the yaw. 
um, for head and neck tumors. And this we find with this, our shifts are, you know, our shifts are minimal, maybe two millimeters, uh, two millimeters um, each time. We very rarely have a shift greater than two millimeters. So, so we're quite happy with the system. We find that it works well. Um, that said, while we do a lot of computer planning for tumors near critical structures, um, we also do a lot of manual treatment planning. So, for example, this is a horrific tumor. It's a hemangiosarcoma, or a tumor of blood vessels, um, that has grown um, on the mandible of this dog. Um, and we chose to treat this palliatively. Because there aren't very many critical structures um, around this, um, we designed a simple parallel opposed, um, or I guess APPA, um, uh, beam arrangement. Um, and did a uh, simple calculation and treated the entire mandible, um, treated the entire mandible to include microscopic disease. And so, so this is, you know, what it looks like. We just sort of set, we set a, a field around the tumor, treating just the, um, treating just the mandible, simple um, parallel opposed field. Um, we use, as we call, poor man's bolus, <laughs> gauze soaked with water, has the same density of tissue. Um, and so we pack that around the tumor, um, and then use uh, some super flab on top just to build up the dose. And with this, we can do a simple, simple mathematical calculation and, and not need the CT scan in the plan. Of course, we prefer to have the CT scan and then a computer plan in all cases, but that adds to the cost of these therapies. And um, for cases like this, we feel we do, especially in the palliative setting, we feel we do a good job with simple parallel opposed. Um, parallel opposed field. This dog, incidentally, this tumor shrank significantly, um, almost to nothing. Um, uh, we're right now about, uh, about let's say, two months after the, after the palliative therapy, and the tumor shrank to nothing. So this tumor responded very, very well to that first fractionated therapy. He got one treatment a week for four weeks, a great per fraction. So quick, um, some, just some examples of acute effects that we see with definitive therapy. And of course, you know, again, here we're walking the fine line of, of efficacy versus, um, versus toxicity. And it makes sense to induce these kinds of side effects in dogs only if we can impact, uh, impact life expectancy significantly. This up here is a dog. Um, dogs, for those of you who have dogs, know that they have anal sacs, which are little diverticula in the skin about 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock around the anus, so they're located about here and here under the skin, and they produce this horribly stinky material. Well, those tumors, those those glands can um, can develop tumors. They develop anal sac adenocarcinoma. They're highly metastatic to regional lymph nodes. So we, uh, when we treat these, we treat um, we treat the perianal area as well as the lymph nodes. And um, it's not uncommon that at the end of therapy, they will have a uh, uh, moist desquamation reaction around the anus here, and it's it's very uncomfortable um, for about you know two to three mm, probably two and a half weeks after radiation therapy, um, and we warn owners that it will be uncomfortable. The dog will want to lick, will have some pain and defecation, tenesmus, that type of thing. Um, the reason it's worth doing this, I think, is that with no therapy, because this is a highly metastatic tumor, most dogs will succumb to either progressive. Uh, progressive tumor growth around the anus or lymph node metastasis and causing constipation um, as it presses on, as the, those pelvic nodes compress the rectum um, uh, and the colon, you usually see that those types of things happen within six months with just surgery alone. If we follow up with radiation and chemotherapy, we get survival times over three years. So this couple weeks of acute effects um, you know, becomes reasonable, uh, becomes reasonable to suffer through, if you will, for, for the added life expectancy that we can give them. This is a classic example of mucositis. Dogs are so food motivated in most cases that they will eat right through this. We treat acute effects with antibiotics, pain medication, and for skin or eyes like this, we will also put e-collars on them, these, you know, these, uh, these Elizabethan cones you may have seen on dogs. Um, just to kind of prevent them from licking. The eyes, of course, um, periocular tissues also are very sensitive to acute effects, and you know we hate to create acute effects in, in eyes. And as we move towards the IMRT, we can prevent those. Um, we try to limit um, late effects as much as possible 
um, the ones that we do see that you know we consider acceptable um, are uh, just some skin changes, um, leukotrichia or alopecia, hyperpigmentation of the skin. This is a dog that was irradiated for a mast cell tumor at the elbow, um, or uh, cataracts. This is a dog that was irradiated palliatively for a nasal tumor. Um, the lens developed a cataract. This dog was blind in this eye eight months after therapy, but was visual out of this eye. So the owners actually weren't even aware that the dog was blind in one eye. Um, the dog functioned completely normally at home. So we always aim, of course, to, to preserve vision in at least one eye. Cats, as I mentioned earlier, cats are just not of this earth. <laughs> they're not like humans. They're not like dogs. Their diseases are different. Um, and they're, so it's not surprising that their radiation effects are different. They just rarely experience acute effects. For that reason, it's just a pleasure to treat cats with radiation. Um, this is a cat that was treated for vaccine-associated sarcoma. Um, what we see with them is, you know, we see the white hair. We see hair grow back white, the leukotrichia. Um, that's very common in cats, but generally, otherwise, acute effects are very, very rare. It's a real pleasure to treat the cats. So to end here, I'll speak just a little bit about the challenges that we face um, in veterinary oncology. Um, we treat a lot of advanced disease. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not inexpensive to go to the veterinarian, so it's also not uncommon that um, pet owners will wait until you know there are serious problems associated with the mass or until an animal is quite sick before they go to the veterinarian. Um, so we're often faced with advanced disease. We also deal with very small volumes if we treat chihuahuas or cats or you know, certainly the exotic animals. So sometimes it's hard to, as I'll show you a picture, it's very difficult to um, treat small volumes, uh, even you know especially when we plan them. Um, we uh, we aim to use ICRU recommendations when we when we plan uh, when we computer plan our radiation treatments, um, and that's not really caught on in veterinary medicine. So standardization therapy in veterinary medicine, for the sake of reporting, um, is just starting to develop now, uh, which certainly you know limits the information that the or really the quality of the information that we have. But we're getting better as our profession grows, um, and high cost, you know, not, unfortunately not everybody, even if they would like to, for their dogs and cats can afford um, or has the financial resources to, to do this. It's expensive, the radiation, um, the imaging, the workup, the staging, the boarding of the pets during the treatment um, is expensive. And also the need for anesthesia presents a challenge in some cases. This is an example of advanced disease um, that we see. This is a, a, a small dog terrier cross that was presented to the oncology group um, at University of Georgia with um, a scar from multiple surgeries that were done, um, uh, multiple surgeries that were done on this dog. Uh, and as you can probably make out here, there are multiple lesions along this scar of recurrence of tumor. This dog, probably about four or five months ago, presented with a simple, small skin mass um, that you know, the owner presented the veterinarian with, and the veterinarian removed the mass. Unfortunately, um, the mass was not submitted to the pathologist. So it was just removed and thrown away. You know, from every, in everyone's perspective, the mass was gone. Everything was great. The mass grew back, not unexpectedly. So another surgery was done. It grew back again. Another surgery was done. And so here we are, four or five months later, down the road, and this dog that had a mast cell tumor, very common skin tumor in dogs now had you know, an extensive scar with an extensive recurrence or along the scar. And here, I don't know if you can appreciate this, but this is the dog's right shoulder area. And it's quite thick relative to you know, the other side. It's quite thick. And that's because there's lymph node metastasis here in the neck. The sad thing for this dog is that mast cell disease is curable with, you know, with radiation therapy um, from the get-go. One of the negative prognostic indicators for mast cell disease is recurrent tumors. So this dog potentially, you know, I could have done something with the radiation, we could have done something radiation-wise for this dog after the first surgery and potentially cured him. Unfortunately, because now the dog has such extensive disease, which is not uncommon for what we see, um, there's not very much that we can do other than chemotherapy, um, and, uh, you know, and the dog's outcome will be much different. Um, the, uh, this is another example of extensive disease. This is a, a large husky with an infiltrative lipoma. And 
you know, what's interesting about this disease is in our world as humans, we get cellulite. That's how we, <laughs> that's how our fat distributes. We develop cellulite. Well, dogs develop lipomas. Those of you who are dog owners are probably very familiar with this. Um, lipomas are just balls of fat. So rather than cellulite, they get these firm masses that collect that you can feel um, that are under the skin that are just balls of fat. Well, occasionally you will get a lipoma that's not a malignant tumor per se. It doesn't metastasize, but it becomes very, 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 very aggressive, and it eats through muscle bodies. It's really like, like the fat that ate Manhattan, if you will. It, in this dog's case, it, it was extensive in the, the tissues of the neck and extended all the way here to the, to the vertebrae. Um, and so in, infiltrative lipomas are very locally aggressive, and eventually they'll grow and be, they're slow growing, but they will grow to be big enough to you know, impede function, potentially ulcerate, although more commonly they'll just grow big enough to create mobility issues. So this dog was presented to us. Unfortunately, it was an enormous tumor in this husky. Um, and this line here represents on the CT scan uh, where it started and stopped this, uh, this, um, this tumor. So the surgeons went in and they did remove it and they placed hemoclips here, as you can see, um, at, the, at the ends of the, of the tumor. And we marked on the CT, we marked the incision with um, some barium so that we could find it. Um, there are hemoclips here, so we could see this, the, uh, the scar on CT. But the incision was just, the incision and the actual extent of the tumor was so big um, that when we uh, went to plan this, the PTV was just enormous. And so, you know, for our purposes, we, uh, we have, at this point, very basic IMRT capabilities, but we treated this dog before we were able to actually implement IMRT. Um, and so we were looking just to use 3D conformal RT. And unfortunately, this dog's field size was too big for me to use wedges. And while I could have used extended distance, um, extended distance treatment, um, uh, I used rather field in field treatments that, that ended up being several, several fields um, uh, to treat this dog. This, these red areas here are the hot spots that were that that were present just with a parallel opposed field. So this, this was a challenging case simply because the size of the tumor um, you know, would have been a very easy tumor to treat a no-brainer if the field were smaller and we could have used wedges. We wouldn't need to, to get into you know, more complicated therapy. So, so these types of compromises that we make um, or adjustments that we make for advanced disease are not uncommon. And here's the opposite problem. We deal with very small animals. This is a chihuahua. Um, the red area is the PTV. It's a, a maxillary, uh, maxillary sarcoma. It was quite a large tumor. Um, the dog's nose is pointed up in the air. This is the brain and spinal cord. This is the mandible here. Um, and this is the MLC pattern. And just as a simple little example here, I, aimed, I was aiming to block the nasal planum, um, uh, the nasal planum here. Um, you know, to spare the nasal planum, the 57 gray that we have to deliver to this tumor. Um, but because the nasal planum is so small and our MLC leaves are quite thick, they're a centimeter wide, you know, it's, it's hard to block the nasal planum and, and, uh, and avoid the PT. Um, again, it would have been a good case for IMRT. We didn't have IMRT capabilities at, at this point yet. Um, so these are the types of challenges that we are presented with in veterinary medicine. Um, the lovely part of our job is that we get to work <laughs> with animals. Um, they actually, I think, you know, uh, quite enjoy the treatments in radiation. Um, you know, there's a team of three of us back there. We spoil them rotten. They get lots of treats after the after the um, after the treatments. They find these little cubby holes to lie in as they're waiting for as they're either recovering from anesthesia or waiting for their treatment. This is a large husky with the infiltrative lipoma. This is a cat that we were treating for vaccine-associated sarcoma. This is a, a little dog that we were treating for um, an anal sac tumor. So they just kind of hang out with us in the radiotherapy uh, vault. Um, it's a very nice life that we live with our patients.